On this Wednesday night, more blockades and more frustration. You are doing something train. illegal. The government is Plain breaking and its own laws. Plus, more calls for the Prime Minister to take action. He is not providing leadership. And why one Indigenous chief is retracting his call for the blockades to end. Inside the Diamond Princess cruise ship. I was so scared. Why this doctor is blasting bureaucrats. Major pile-up in Quebec, multiple injuries and multiple vehicles written off. And haunted by a horrific fire in Halifax. And nothing can prepare you for uh, the impact of the tragedy. Flashbacks to the fire that killed seven children. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The dispute over a natural gas pipeline in northern B.C. continues to have repercussions across the country. Via Rail is temporarily laying off 1,000 employees because the blockades on rail lines have interrupted most of its services, the first time that's happened in Via's 42-year history. The blockades have now gone on for almost two weeks. Today, another one was set up on a rail line near the historic Victoria Bridge in Montreal, and another went up on the CN Main Line in Edmonton. Do you know how many trains go through Spruce Grove in a day? About every 30 minutes. Do you know that? We also have the right. You don't, us. and you don't care. And you that's know? the sad part. Some local residents then moved in and began to dismantle the blockade. It and the others are shows of solidarity for a group of Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs who oppose the coastal gaslink pipeline being built through their territory. The natural gas pipeline was first proposed in 2012. It's gone through all the required approvals and consultations with Indigenous groups. It has received consent from some hereditary chiefs and 20 elected ban councils along the route, but a handful of hereditary chiefs oppose it and say they have jurisdiction over the territory. It has put Prime Minister Justin Trudeau under intense pressure. This government is working extremely hard to resolve this situation. Uh, we know that people are facing shortages, they're facing disruptions, they're facing layoffs. That's unacceptable. His critics, though, say it's time to act and end the blockades. Alberta's Justice Minister tweeted today, Albertans will not be economic hostages to law-breaking extremists. There's words some of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have left northern B.C. and are on their way to southern Quebec to meet members of the Mohawk community who have blocked a rail line there. We'll get to that in just a moment, but we begin with Michael Couture on what political leaders are doing as calls to end the blockades get louder. The sounds of traditional drums rang out on the rails on the western edge of Edmonton, signaling more support of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. Get Coastal Gaslink to respect Wet'suwet'en law and remove themselves from their territory, along with the Royal Colonial Mounted Police. Later in the day, a manifestation of the frustration that some are feeling. Some residents arrived saying the Prime Minister isn't doing anything, so they were going to take action and began dismantling the blockade. That frustration is being felt and voiced in Ottawa, where opposition leaders continue to demand a solution to the nearly 14-day standoff. So once again, can he tell people who are just laid off on what day they can get back to work? Continuing to do everything we can to resolve this situation peacefully. But some premiers are tired of waiting, so they held a conference call to discuss next steps that they can take to end the blockades. We cannot exclude to use police, but it has to be done in coordination in every provinces at the same time. That's not an option the federal government is considering, calling instead for calm. This is a pivotal point in, in our history. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller is in constant communication with the protesters near Belleville, Ontario, in an effort to maintain a level of trust. And he says the highest levels of government are working on a solution. Minister Blair, Minister Garneau, Minister Bennett, the Prime Minister himself and myself, as long as other ministers that can, that can ensure the channels of communication mm -hmm. remain open and are conducive to positive discussions. It's a whole-of-government approach from a party that campaigned on reconciliation with Indigenous people. But Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says that ideal and the economy 
are being hijacked in the process. The reconciliation doesn't mean allowing a couple of people to shut down the national economy. Late tonight, the Premier sent out a joint statement asking for a meeting with the Prime Minister via teleconference to discuss paths to a peaceful resolution. No word from Trudeau's office on whether or not he'll take them up on that offer. Donna. Okay, Mike Lucature, thanks. In a sign of just how tense and complex the issue is, including among Indigenous leaders, the Grand Chief of Quebec's Ganasatake First Nation today did a U-turn. He's retracted his plea to the demonstrators to end the blockades as a show of good faith. Here's a bit of what Grand Chief Serge Otsi Simon said yesterday. Bringing down the, road, the, uh, the blockades doesn't mean that you surrender, like I said a while ago. It doesn't mean we're going to just lay down and let them kick us, uh, kick us around. No. But it would show compassion along with the strength. That did not sit well with some Ganesatake Mohawks. They padlocked the doors of the Chief's Band Council office and called on him to resign. Today, he retracted his comments, saying it's not his place to make such judgments. I've had concerns about the potential consequences of such actions. But sometimes a leader, uh, you have to know, as a leader, you have to know when to lead and when to follow. I am now deciding to follow the people. I apologize for any harm or confusion. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson joins me now. Mercedes, there's a real difference of views across the board on what should happen next. Some hereditary Wet'suwet'en chiefs are heading east from northern B.C. Are they intending to meet with the prime minister or, or do we know the purpose of their trip? Donna, we're hearing that those hereditary chiefs who are all opposed to the coastal gaslight pipeline are flying east not to meet with the prime minister or the government in Ottawa, but to thank the Mohawk who have erected rail barricades in their support. The goal behind the trip is to strengthen the alliance between First Nations, and that will begin as early as tomorrow when the hereditary chiefs will meet with the Mohawk of Tyendinaga in Ontario. And then on Saturday, they head to Quebec to sit down with the Mohawk First Nation of Ganawage. It's all a show of unity and expression of solidarity as they ignore Ottawa's offer to meet with Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett. The chiefs say that they won't talk to Ottawa until the RCMP get off their land. But that could be difficult. An Indigenous lawyer who we spoke to says that the provincial and federal governments cannot order the police to do anything when it comes to operations, no matter which side of the debate, whether that's clearing protesters or whether that's ceasing to enforce the injunction in B.C. But Sarah Sarah Mainville believes there may be a creative solution if everyone comes to the table. The CN has, has sort of um, allowed uh, operational police decisions to decide when and, when and where uh, the, uh, that injunction was enforced. If Coastal Gaslings was of the same mindset, we might actually get a stand down uh, by the RCMP. And Donna, of course, we bring you the latest on how those meetings go. All right, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. So much of what we consume and what companies need to operate is shipped by rail in this country. And these blockades, which have no end in sight right now, are having an effect on jobs and the economy. That's what Eric Sorensen is looking at tonight. The economic impact is spreading. Via Rail has announced 1,000 temporary layoffs over rail blockades by Indigenous protesters. CN says it is laying off 450 workers in eastern Canada after 400 trains were cancelled in the last week. And in Halifax, the Atlantic Container Line is rerouting shipments to ports and railroads in the U.S. Several business associations have written to the Prime Minister, stating they fully share a commitment to reconciliation, but call for all parties, including law enforcement authorities, to bring an end to the ongoing disruptions. So is forcible removal an economic solution? I think that that's a question that's best left up to uh, government and law enforcement. Small business leaders want rail service resumed immediately, but there's recognition that forcing an end to the blockades could be short-sighted. We want to ensure that the resolution reached is something sustainable. The last thing anybody wants wants is to see service resumed and then suddenly abruptly stopped again. The blockades are just one body blow to the Canadian economy. Coastal Gaslink, the Frontier Tech oil sands project and the TMX pipeline all inject controversy and uncertainty into the economy. This pipeline will never be built. There's political pushback and one environmental well, spokesperson thinks civil disobedience the like the rail blockades could occur over TMX as well. Uh, we're getting a taste of what things could look like if uh, there's an attempt to push this project through BC right now. 
And yet another broadside to the economy, coronavirus. China says it will have an impact on its economy, and Canada will feel the effects on top of our homemade economic troubles. All of these effects are all pushing in the same direction. The Canadian economy uh, was already expected to deliver modest growth, and now things have are going to be weakened by the, the impact of the flu epidemic and, and rail disruptions. Craig Alexander says the rail blockades should be dealt with because the longer they last, the greater the national impact. With coronavirus, Canada will feel the global economic effects. Together, they could turn current headwinds into an economic windstorm. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Now to Japan and what's happening on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. After 14 days of quarantine, authorities are now allowing hundreds of passengers to leave, some walking off the ship and getting into taxis. Infectious disease specialists say that violates all infection control protocols. At least 620 people from the ship have now tested positive, including 47 Canadians. As Mike Armstrong reports, one infectious disease expert says things were so bad he was scared to be on board. With more passengers testing positive every day, there's been no question something went wrong with the quarantine on the Diamond Princess. I can't bear with it. I can't bear with it. Well, this is a video posted to YouTube by a Japanese infectious diseases expert. Kentaro Iwata was on the ship Tuesday and calls it chaotic. Iwata says over and over he saw things that could spread the virus. People wearing protective gloves, eating or using cell phones, papers carried from room to room. He says he's worked on cholera, SARS and Ebola, and this experience is the first time he's been frightened. Inside Princess Diamond, I was so scared. I was so scared of getting COVID-19 because there was no way to tell where the virus is. We took Iwata's complaints to a Montreal infectious diseases expert. Dr. Chan Liang calls it alarming. He says the theory has been that the virus may have spread in the ventilation system. If it's because of the protocols were not respected, were not properly Im implemented, then uh, there is no excuse for that to happen. With the 14-day quarantine period wrapping up, foreign nationals are now being moved off the ship. Australia and Hong Kong pick people up today. They'll be quarantined in their home countries again. But Japanese citizens who haven't tested positive are now free to leave. Dr. Liang says that's a mistake, considering there are still new cases on the ship every day. They shouldn't be free. They should be uh, monitored further. A plane is now in Japan to pick up Canadians from the ship. They'll be screened Thursday and likely head home Friday for another quarantine. Dr. Liang says this group is more at risk than the group that was brought back from China. I strongly believe that there would be positive cases from that group. You're not beating around the bush. You just said strongly. Uh, I strongly, I strongly, uh, I think, believe there will be positive cases. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. In China, where the outbreak began, the number of new confirmed cases is beginning to drop. And yesterday, for the first time, the number of people in China who recovered from the virus was greater than the number of new cases. More than 75,000 cases have now been confirmed worldwide, and more than 2,100 people have died. The vast majority of those cases are in China. And Iran announced today that two people in that country have died. According to Iranian state media, they were elderly and had been in the hospital. They are Iran's first confirmed cases. The COVID-19 crisis is posing problems for drug makers. Coming up, the uncertainty ahead for pharmacies and hospitals. In Quebec, at least 69 people are injured, nine of them seriously, after this multi-vehicle crash. Several emergency crews are at the scene of the pileup, which shut down the highway around 20 kilometers south of Montreal. At least 100 cars and 12 trucks are involved. Authorities suspect the crash was caused by a sudden whiteout, as blowing snow made for very dangerous driving conditions. Another train carrying crude oil has derailed, the third in under three months. A CN freight train near Emo, Ontario, went off the tracks at around 8.30 last night. Emergency crews arrived on the scene this morning. 30 rail cars left the tracks. Several are still leaking crude oil. Thirteen days ago, more than a million litres of crude spilled when a CP train derailed near Guernsey, Saskatchewan. That was the second crude oil tanker train to derail in that same area in two months. 
Those three derailments have reignited the debate about the safety of carrying oil by rail across Canada. More crude is moving along Canadian railways than in previous years as production increases and new pipeline projects are stalled. The most recent data from the Canada Energy Regulator shows the volume of oil carried by trains in 2019 averaged more than 250,000 barrels a day. That's a major increase from 2012 to 2019 when trains moved an average of 143,000 barrels a day. Production of crude oil is expected to increase by more than a million barrels a day by 2035. There are warnings tonight the outbreak of COVID-19 could lead to a critical shortage of pharmaceuticals and medical supplies. The majority of those products are made in China, where factories have ground to a halt and production has all but stopped. Jackson Prosco reports on the uncertain impact on hospitals, doctors and patients. China's locked down cities and shuttered factories threaten to pinch the supply of critical medicines and medical equipment around the world. Really, the supply chain issues will be dictated by what happens with the outbreak. The EU Chamber of Commerce warns of a potential global shortage of antibiotics. Drug makers in North America are bracing for production problems. China produces 80% of the world's supply of active pharmaceutical ingredient. Those are the parts of the pills that actually do something. The situation is described as fluid. In Canada, experts have long warned about the problem of drug shortages. This new coronavirus outbreak threatens to make things worse. There are a number of manufacturing facilities in China that could potentially be disrupted, but we're not hearing of it at this point, and uh, it, we, we don't want anyone to panic right now. The only confirmed supply issues are for medical equipment like masks and respirators. Demand has shot up 100-fold and prices have soared. Right now we expect that demand will outpace supply for the near future. In North America, experts have asked the general public not to buy masks, stressing they're simply not needed and should be saved for frontline responders. All of it adds up to a tenuous situation for doctors and hospitals who may be forced to make tough decisions if supplies are jeopardized. It's possible that in the medium term, while we start to build up alternative sources of supply, that non-essential surgeries or services that can, healthcare services that can be postponed are uh, postponed. With so much of the world's production centered in China, alternate sources may be hard to come by. Both Canada and the United States maintain strategic stockpiles of medicine and other equipment. They're meant to mount a rapid response, but not a long-term one. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Pulling strings in the OR, the patient undergoing brain surgery and putting on a concert. That's coming up. Turkey's president has delivered what he calls a final warning for Russian-backed forces to retreat from northern Syria. Recep Tayyip Erdogan says a Turkish military operation to push back a Syrian government offensive is imminent. Talks with Russia yesterday failed to reach an agreement to ease tensions over the last rebel-held stronghold in Syria. Turkey wants Russia to force the Syrian government to retreat to positions they held before the advance into Idlib and Aleppo. For weeks, Syrian forces have been conducting a crushing military campaign, and civilians, including children, are caught in the middle. He fought the fire but couldn't save the children. Next, a Halifax firefighter breaks his silence. This woman is doing something remarkable. She's playing the violin while undergoing brain surgery. Doctors at a London hospital wanted to ensure her ability to play music was preserved. So before surgery, they mapped her brain and then had her play as they removed a tumor close to parts of her brain that controlled delicate movements of her left hand. The 53-year-old woman was diagnosed in 2013. She's been playing the violin since she was 10. And the surgeon, who's an accomplished pianist, removed 90% of the tumor and left the woman's hand fully functional. Well, it's been a year since a fire in Halifax completely destroyed a home and the dreams of a refugee couple from Syria. All seven of their children died in that fire. It's impossible to imagine how anyone could cope. The community rallied around them, and now, for the first time, a firefighter who tried to save the children is talking about what everyone endured that night. Ross Lord has his story. 
Firefighter Brendan Marr admits his burden is heavier one year to the day after the most horrifying house fire he's ever seen. I think there's a, a sadness that, that not just the first responders, but uh, everyone in the community and I think a lot of people across Canada are feeling over, over uh, you know, what was a real tragedy. The fire was very well advanced and far ahead of us before we got there. We were able to knock down most of the fire that was around us, but we weren't able to get to the second floor um, to do search up where the bedrooms were. At first, Marr and his colleagues were told there were two people trapped inside. In the end, they removed seven bodies, all children between the ages of 14 and three months old. A loss like that, especially with children uh, and, you know, seven children, there's, there's no preparation for that. They were the children of Syrian refugees who came to Canada in 2017 to find a safer home. Their father, Ibrahim Barho, was badly burnt and almost killed trying to fight the fire. Their mother, Kauthar Barho, survived with no physical injuries, but devastated by an unimaginable loss. As friends and former neighbours commemorate that loss, there's a glimmer of good news. Doctors say Ibrahim Barho's slow recovery is turning a corner. Ibrahim is recovering, I think, as, as well as anyone would expect, given the extent of his injuries. Uh, and we're at the point now where we're sort of preparing to transition back to the community. In a statement this week, the Barhos expressed deep gratitude for the love and support they've received over the past year. They say they miss their children every day. Marr commends his managers for offering psychological support that helps ease his mind, although flashbacks are always close by. I was walking a couple of nights ago. Um, we could, you know, it was clear night and uh, just looking up uh, it was a bit of a, uh, it was a trigger to, uh, for, for, you know, memories of that night. As president of the Halifax Firefighters Union, he wants his members to know it's okay to feel sorrow. It's just part of who we are now. We keep walking forward and, uh, you know, share our thoughts with each other. Embracing both pride in what they tried to do and grief over the outcome. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Air Canada is Lanark Highlands, Ontario. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.